Good evening, everyone. We'll just wait another 30 seconds and allowing people to join us. Okay, I think we'll begin. We have a, a very interesting, exciting 90 minutes ahead of us. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Rachel Huxley. I'm the Executive Dean for Health at Deakin University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's webinar. Um, and I suspect that the next 90 minutes will be a very thought provoking and insightful glimpse into the COVID-19 pandemic and the potential aftermath. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to acknowledge country as we gather for this webinar, physically dispersed and virtually constructed. Let us take a moment to reflect the meaning of place and doing so recognize the various traditional lands on which we hold this webinar tonight. We acknowledge the elders past, present, emerging of all the land that we work and live on and their ancestral spirits with gratitude and respect. I'd now like to hand over to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Ian Martin, to formally open the event. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much indeed, Rachel, and welcome everybody. Um, today's panel is going to highlight the important contributions that universities have made over the last six to eight months in understanding and managing the pandemic. Whilst there's been much to be concerned about, one of the most extraordinary features that I've seen is a global role for universities in understanding, assessing, interpreting, analyzing, and providing information back to politicians and the wider community in ways that I've almost never seen before. Now, Deacon's absolutely been at heart of this through a whole variety of activities. And tonight gives us an opportunity to look at the Australian global responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, compare our response in Australia to other countries um, and think about what a post-COVID world may look like and what capabilities and practices we'll need to manage into the future. This has been the most extraordinary six to eight months. It is a once in a hundred year event. At least we hope it is only a once in a hundred year event. Um, the impact both physical, socially, culturally, and ultimately economically has been extraordinary around the globe. And we're only beginning to disentangle many, many aspects of that. But right from the beginning, researchers within Deakin and around the world have started to work on understanding the virus, understanding the implications of the virus, and bringing viral pandemic strategies to the fore in terms of the best way of managing. It's been an extraordinary time to see how that rapidly evolving and expanding science has been translated into practice in different parts of the world and how the interface between science and policy, science and social environment and science and culture has played out in different jurisdictions and how within different cultural mindsets, the very same science can produce incredibly different policy advice and policy outcomes. And I think that's a really important part of where we go, understanding how all of those multifactorial aspects come together. Now, tonight, we're really talking with a focus on health, but it's important to remember that the input of universities and deacons, no exception, goes well beyond health. Um, engineers have been involved in some of the practical interpretations. Uh, at the beginning, uh, researchers were involved in uh, prefabrication and using 3D printing to produce equipment. Um, the rapid production of hand sanitizer and many other things uh, are economists involved in thinking about economic impact. But tonight is about health. The impacts of Deacon Health have been not only related to uh, our health professionals, our allied and employed academics, our healthcare students who've been involved in many aspects, but also our research and scientists beginning to come to grips. And tonight we're joined with uh, three colleagues but it's important to point out, and I've just been joined by a dog. <laughs> um, it's important to point out that, that um, we've got many, many links. We've worked with partners in uh, Barwon Health, um, the Geelong Centre for Emerging Infectious Diseases, uh, working with clinicians there, uh, thinking about how telehealth plays a role. And again, the implications of telehealth both now and the future have been uh, Remarkable, our involvement with the new clinical trials center, new testing methodologies, reducing the need for reagents, 
and working with uh, Eugene Nathan and Peter Villeman, uh, looking at the COVID-19 Research Task Force. There are many, many aspects that we can pull out, but I think tonight gives us an opportunity to hear the reflections of three leading academics that will give us their reflections and perspectives and hopefully lead to a, a fulsome and interesting conversation. And perhaps the first of many that we can possibly have around how we think about the role of universities in helping guide and assess evidence-informed policy. So um, I look forward to hearing from all three of them tonight and the conversations at the end. So thank you very much indeed in advance. And back to you, Rachel. Oh, thank you, Ian. And thank you for your, to your dog for making a guest appearance. Um, I have the pleasure of emceeing tonight. And when Sam Johnson, I have to um, acknowledge Sam's work in pulling this event together. Uh, when we first discussed the idea a few months ago, I, I naively assumed that we'd be doing more of a reflection on, on COVID. And lo and behold, um, many of us are still under curfew in stage four. Um, so tonight we have three outstanding epidemiologists um, giving very different perspectives on the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Professor Catherine Bennett, who is the Chair of, uh, in Epidemiology within the School of Health and Social Development, is, has probably become a household name over the past few months because she has been the voice of ra rational thought and informed uh, opinion uh, when it comes to uh, the COVID-19. Um, so I look forward to hearing from Catherine. Professor Tony LaMontagna uh, is another professor within the School of Health and Social Development, uh, who chairs, this, who's head of the uh, Social Determinants of Health group. Uh, Tony has done a, a tremendous amount of work in uh, assessing and evaluating uh, mobile testing clinics. And, but his perspective tonight is looking at the aftermath, the mental health implications in particular of the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly how it impacts on different um, socioeconomic groups. Um, and Glenn Navarak, welcome, from, who's currently based in New York in the UK at the moment. Glenn is an alum of the School of Health and Social Development. He did his PhD with, with uh, Professor John Catford, who was the, the Executive Dean of Health uh, ooh, 10, 15 years ago. Glenn has been instrumental in assisting with the WHO's response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and has had on the ground experience in terms of supporting the Spanish efforts in, to, in um, reducing the impact of the pandemic there. So throughout the next 45, 15 minutes, we're going to be hearing from each of the three speakers and you'll have the opportunity to pose your own questions. I'm sure there's going to be a a large number of questions generated by the discussion tonight. So feel, please feel free to, to include a question in the chat box. Um, around eight o'clock, I'll come back and do some uh, fielding of those questions to our experts and we'll wrap up around 8, 28, 25. So I'm really looking forward to um, the, the discussion and I'm going to start now with Professor Catherine Bennett. So, Catherine uh, is, has had a distinguished career in public health practice, research, academic governance and teaching. Uh, Catherine has worked previously with New South Wales Health in the Hunter region whilst completing a Master of Applied Epidemiology with the ANU. And then she was the Olympic Public Health Coordinator for Northern Sydney for the Sydney Olympics in 2000. Um, Ten years ago, she joined Deakin from the University in the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences, where she was Director of Population Health Practice. Uh, from in the Melbourne School of Population Health. Catherine's research includes large community cohorts focused on community transmission of infectious diseases and antimicrobial resistance. She was also founding professor of the Council of Academ Academic Public Health Institutions Australia. So over to you, Catherine. Thank you, Rachel. I'll just see if I've got control here. Let's wait for the slides. So, so I do have a mixed background, which was um, one that brought together my experience in, in actually leading outbreak investigations and doing that frontline work around um, contact tracing and so on, as well as the experience I've had, you know, particularly focused on community transmission of infectious diseases. And all of that training prepares you for something like this. We've been waiting for the pandemic. We've, you know, been looking at, at the pandemic plans and so on. But it's only when something like this hits, you can never actually be sure what your role might be. So for me, it, 
turned out very early um, to be one that was evolving into one around public health messaging, as Rachel said, you know, a, a big presence in the media now that really started from back in February, where I worked on a piece with The Guardian, looking at um, the what was starting to already emerge as some problems with communication and, and consistency of communication when you're faced with an outbreak, an unknown agent and so many other things adding to the confusion. And in fact, even from the early days, there was quite a bit of criticism publicly about what was happening in different, differently in different states and, and where the things were being led by the Australian government versus state level. But we also had experts who had different opinions about what should happen as well. And that creates an environment that can be most um, confusing for people, but it can also create a, a, an ideal setting for conspiracy theories to start as well as people to push their own political agendas. And in fact, we saw that happen quite early and that's only gained traction as we've continued, even though a lot of work's been put into communication since. So people are hungry for data, they're hungry for information, that hunger needs to be fed. But the data we're looking at, even those simple days, uh, day, daily counts, are actually very complex in terms of what's behind the numbers and how they need to be understood and interpreted. So getting that right, helping assist that, as an epidemiologist, you might be able to bridge some of that data coming out of government, work with media and take it to the public, I think is an area where um, you know, there has been a very large role and a number of people are contributing to this, not just me, but it's the bit that links that policy to action. It's the bit that actually translates to outbreak control and that having an engaged community is a critical part of that. With the media, it's been an extraordinary unprecedented time in terms of building that partnership. And this is actually a thread that Melissa Davey, who's the um, chief of the Melbourne Bureau of The Guardian, put out in this last week, trying to prompt a conversation about senior women who've been contributing to the um, COVID response. And I was quite chuffed. You know, she mentioned me and some of the names she threw out there when she was trying to really start a, a bigger conversation with other people contributing. But it was interesting to me that she recognised this role as being quite critical in science comms and in particular helping the media to interpret and understand all the models and science that's being talked about. So like any relationship, you have your good and your bad days. But overall, I have been really impressed by the efforts that our journalists have gone to to really try and get their head around something which is quite complex and also coming to me with particular ideas about, you know, turning the media, recognising the, um, the, the mood and trying to get more constructive media happening or more uh, positive and forward-looking media happen, happening at times where it was getting bogged down. Um, so I think that was really important and deserves acknowledgement up front. So what are these numbers? These are the daily counts and this is the information that's collated each day by the ABC on their um, data charts site. So our first wave, we, were, we knew it was imported, we were looking for it amongst return travellers and visitors, but then we don't know, um, unless we're sort of thinking about our testing in terms of eyes, we don't know what else is happening beyond the scope of our testing. And in fact, as an epidemiologist, my most fearful time was in the first wave when back in middle, uh, middle March, they actually restricted the testing purely to those return travellers and their close contacts or someone who was a close contact of a, a confirmed case, which was kind of the same pool. And the only other people tested were people with a community onset infection that developed into pneumonia and they were hospitalised with no other known cause for the pneumonia. So, um, in looking at this, I think we actually missed most of wave one because we weren't even testing people with symptoms in the community. Now, this isn't a model. This is purely me drawing on a, on a graph to show for effect what we might have missed. But in fact, it's, it's probably not a bad guess in a way. If we look at this, how do we compare wave one where we had such narrow um, testing to wave two where we went out and we've actually act actively encouraged people to come forward for testing with any symptoms whatsoever. If we look at the deaths, and this is something I'm involved in an international study looking at excess deaths, not just those um, identified as COVID deaths. 
and some more detailed work I've done with a colleague from um, Monash University, um, Rebecca Kippen, we've looked at the um, flu and, in, and pneumonia deaths over this period. And flu is actually down this year compared to last year. We were tracking the same, brought in stage three, and our flu dropped away from 90 to one death in the month of April. But when you look at uh, pneumonia deaths, we actually have as many excess pneumonia deaths that aren't explained in above past averages as we do um, identified COVID cases. And pneumonia is probably one of the categories where you might capture COVID cases where people weren't tested for COVID, but, um, and therefore not, the disease not attributed to it, but who died of pneumonia. And when you take into account the um, flu lives that have been saved and weren't lost in that time, that's another 80 or 90 again. So we might have actually had more COVID deaths than we realised at the time. And if you relate that to the, for every person who, who died of COVID, there's probably 99 out there in the community that weren't even brought in for testing, then you can see we've probably missed a lot of cases. My point here is that the first wave and the second wave could be a lot more alike than we've ever really appreciated. The other way of looking at this is looking at the hospitalised data. And this is showing the first and second wave Australia-wide. The blues, your hospitalisations, and then you've got ICU in orange and the vent uh, ventilated patients in red. And you can see the orange and red numbers, these are all counts, actually look very similar in the first and second wave. And yet there's a massive difference in hospitalisations, which to me shows that, again, we've got hospitalised patients that we weren't testing for COVID, didn't fit the definition, and then all the related cases out in the community because our hospitalizations are only 15%. So we got to a point where we had still had some imported cases. We had some low level community transmission. We'd put a whole blitz, testing blitz in place. We decided we weren't going to test our asymptomatic cases, so they continue to be uncounted in this. But we were in a position where we looked pretty good and pretty strong until we had the breach in the hotel quarantine. So this is the genomic data that's been talked about a lot in relation to that quarantine outbreak. It shows us the first wave, all the orange dots are those that are imported strains, new strains or close variants on a strain. And then the blue shows where there's been some community transmission that's actually linked to some of these imported cases. This is your time scale here. We have another cluster that petered out that was sort of running in that middle of the year. And here are the four cases linked to the major um, quarantine breach. So one family. We have a cluster that's probably associated with your workers at the hotel, and then it's taken out to the community and we see this massive transmission. So the point here is that we pretty much closed down everything that was happening in this first wave. We probably weren't measuring any of the blue ones <laughs> or many of the blue ones over here. So this is probably looks more different than it really was. But at the same time, it shows, which is what we're now hearing, that these are new introduced strains with effectively um, closed down transmission. And we had a reintroduction of the virus in late May that then translated to these um, late June um, outbreaks that started to fly. So from this, what do we take? It tells us that stage three in the first wave worked. That was a strong enough and long enough intervention to close community transmission, even where we weren't measuring at all. And that's the one value, great value of a, of a restriction like that, that's broad sweeping, that's effective, is that it actually shuts down the transmission and you don't have to test everyone to know where the virus is. You just reduce everybody's um, close contacts and you can close it down. It shows how important sampling of community cases is so that you can actually see where the virus is and what's happening. But it also, to me, tells me how blame can get in the way in some of these conversations. So we were certainly focused on what was happening in the hotel, and that was quite a distraction. We were focused on what was happening in the areas where the virus really started to take off in June, July. And that was sometimes, you know, attributed to ethnicity, religion, and a whole range of other things including lack of compliance in this group. So there was a lot of conversation that started to try and blame people for what was going wrong and why this outbreak was taking off. And we might have missed some of those fundamental um, lessons in this that we could take from wave one and apply with confidence in wave two. And one of those 
was the conversation around needing a stage four, even before we put stage three in the second time, was built on this assumption that phase, the first wave was, or the second wave was the result of failed suppression in the first wave. And that's just not true. But to actually go into this argument for stage four, saying stage three didn't work the first time, when in fact, we've got very good evidence that it did, I think undermined what we could achieve with stage three in a second wave. And we're already facing that problem of fatigue and all the other things that can undermine it. So this is what the outbreak looks like in my head. Um, if you think about this as your kind of histogram over time, what happens is you start off with community transmission occurring and you can have low level like we've seen in New South Wales and you can have that being shut down, tripping along, shut down for, for weeks. But you reach a point where your community transmission can become um, widespread enough and, and your prevalence high enough that you increase your likelihood that someone will be positive and take it into work either you know with symptoms or when they're pre-symptomatic and start this workplace outbreak and once you get to that point this can escalate very quickly because what actually happens is before these are discovered these outbreaks are feeding virus back into the community not quite the same homes but into the homes of the co-workers in that aged care facility or in that abattoir and you can then see this spread throughout the community so this acts like an accelerator and it's not your sort of standard mixing model that we sometimes think about in simple infectious disease models. This is a very complex one where this virus works so well in clusters. But what that means is it really matters where the virus lands in the community. This is a piece of work done by the Age newspaper where they were looking at um, case reports according to SES um, levels, so socioeconomic groups and building it on this measure of disadvantage. And the purple is the most disadvantaged group. That's your, your lower 20, lower quintile, 20, 20%. And, and then this is your second most. And these happen to be the cluster of LGAs that in fact were the places where the virus landed. That's presumably where the hotel workers were more likely to live, took it home. And very quickly we saw the uh, community transmission start to rise and then the outbreak starts to take off, which kept fueling this. And we know that more than half of the aged care facilities impacted were in these very areas where the virus landed in the first place, because that's where the transmission rates were the highest. So these people had the virus come into the community and then it was impacting their own relatives in aged care, their own schools and so on. So a really difficult time. It looks different across the rest of Melbourne. There was a delay in the virus moving through into other LGAs. And by the time you put these preventions in place, so this is the hotspot lockdown that occurred, that's not going to be visible until about here because the people in this part here were already infected when that was put in place. So you're just starting to see these cases which were actually infected over here. But this is still flying because you've got these outbreaks, these existing outbreaks, and they're really hard to contain because you've now got reasonable levels in the community. So even as we bring in more and more restrictions, it takes a lot to turn this around. But we have, and Melbourne's numbers now, um, sitting at 73 today, are really about what's happened in these areas. And I think it's an extraordinary story under very difficult circumstances, but it's not the same for all of Victoria. But as I said earlier, there was a lot of conversation and a lot of blame that started to play out in, in the public debate. And this is a piece from the um, principal of El Taqwa, the school where we had for the first time we were seeing high numbers of cases, unusual in a school setting, but as much because the, the children were actually infected out in the community and actually bringing it into school. And so it's a very complex situation, but one that was made much more difficult because it was so um, focused in the way the virus hit Melbourne and the way it played out. So going back to a basic outbreak response model, we move to active surveillance, we go and do that active testing, we've broadened it, now we've got the capacity to do it. And this case interview and contact tracing has to be your first primary focus. And we've got better at doing that within 24, 48 hours, getting people who might be at risk of being new cases isolated before they might pass it on. But it took us a long time to get there. We've done a good job with the genomics work. That's been, you know, 
up and working from very early on with the Doherty growing the virus and being the first to do that in the world. We've also done a lot of work around the case series analysis and chains of transmission, particularly understanding those workplace outbreaks. And modelling has been involved right from the start in terms of scenario testing. And all these things are important in how they inform our interventions. But the one area that I'm not hearing about, it doesn't mean it's not being done, but it's certainly not being put out there publicly, are the other analytic studies you can do based on case control studies and so on to understand in more detail some of the risks that are under, underlying this community transmission. So this is just a plot again of the cases, this time broken down into community transmission in blue. But the yellow ones, these are under investigation, but these yellow are the ones that have been put into the basket saying that these are um, unknown links, unknown source, the community transmission, we don't know where they got the virus, the so-called mystery cases. And these are the things that are going to probably drive our decisions about when we can open up most is these cases because the health department worries, rightly, that they might signal there are more cases out there. They might be separated from a known cluster by some asymptomatic people. So they do want to understand these cases, but I haven't yet seen some of this really standard kind of analytic work we do if we were scaling up a normal outbreak response. Instead, we've gone to something that looks a bit different, which I think is sort of motivated by the pandemic. But the problem is, if you can't figure out risk, you don't have to know exactly where someone got the virus to understand what might have altered their risk. You end up moving to something that's like a blanket um, restriction. So you say, well, let's suppress all people, everybody's number of contacts, because that's the only way we know how we can be sure we can suppress this transmission. So can't be precise, can't be surgical because you haven't got the information. And maybe there is no information to get, but it'd be good to know whether that's been looked at because that might allow us to have a more precise response. This is some work I've done just looking at masks and how they impact its reproductive rate, the number of cases each case generates in an incubation period. This is when we start to see the effects of all our heaviest levels of restriction. But here we've got the dots, the stars show when masks were introduced in the different settings, regional and Victoria. And you know, there is an impact that's interesting to look at. You need to look at that in more detail. But it's by looking at this, making sense of these numbers that we'll be able to map our way ahead and decide what um, restrictions or rules we need to have in place. So just to sum up, you do have to keep the, the public informed. It has to be consistent. And we've learned from, from the wave one that we need it to be tailored to different sectors in the community. You have to do research on the fly in this situation because it is a new agent, a new situation, but that's incredibly important. And no matter how complex a causation might be, masks as an example is a complex one. Masks can prevent the spread of the virus, but they also change people's behaviours and how often they go out or how reminded they are that this is not normal, that it might in fact be, be more complicated than you'd expect. But we need to go through this evaluation process in order to have a really good understanding of what the rules should be and what to invest in. So surge capacity, operating at scale, not losing some of our, our, our understanding and our talent, our capacity in outbreak response in the process of moving to the scale we needed in Victoria in the second wave is also critical and something I'm sure we'll look at. So going ahead, we're learning a lot more about aged care. We cannot see that continue. Do we need a central centre for disease control um, to actually help the states and build a central capacity Probably, I think there's a lot of people that are keen to see that sort of um, capacity built in Australia. Regional public health, do we now move to more of a hub and spoke model in Victoria, given the challenges we faced in this second wave compared to say, the way it can be managed in, in New South Wales. And also the simple things like having paperless contact tracing, to be using paper in this day and age is crazy and to not have well-connected systems linking the states, let alone the states and the Australian government and we saw that today in the process of reporting 31 additional deaths that are actually one or two weeks old, but the process of communicating those deaths through the state and the Australian government systems has actually slowed that down. When I started my studies to go back post PhD to do some applied epidemiology training, John Caldor, also another great epidemiologist and biostats person working in this space, said to me, you know, if you do this, if you work in communicable disease epidemiology, the world is your oyster. And I think it's true. We need more epidemiologists. And that's one of the biggest lessons learned. 
And so hopefully this will inspire people now that we know what the word is. We also know what they do, but we also know we need more of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, for that beautifully succinct and clear explanation of the numbers. I sense a movie in the making, nothing like a good movie to stimulate the uh, interest in, in epidemiology. Um, our next speaker, we've got um, already, we've, we've got a number of, of questions in our question and answer box. Um, please keep them coming. We'll, we'll come to them uh, when after all of the, the panelists have, have spoken. Our second um, speaker for tonight is Professor Tony LaMontagna. Tony leads the Determinants of Health Research Domain in the Institute for Health Transformation at Deakin University. His broad research interest is in developing the scientific and public understanding of work as a social determinant of health and translating this research into policy and practice to improve workplace and worker health. Specific areas of interest include workplace mental health, improving job quality and psychosocial working conditions, and evaluating government policy interventions. His research and publications have influenced policy and practice here in Australia in workplace health from the local to the national level. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Tony. Thank you very much. Over to you, Tony. And you're on mute, Tony. Yeah, I know. I couldn't get at the button there. Sorry. Thanks, Rachel. And good evening, everyone. Oh, there we go. Well, skipping ahead. OK, I've got the controls under control, finally. So I'm going to do a brief presentation in two parts for you. First, a close-up view, uh, a study of safety in a general practice context, looking at drive-through clinics and respiratory clinics. This was a project funded by the Federal Department of Health and led by the Department of General Practice at the University of Melbourne. And then we're gonna step back and take a wider angle view, looking at the um, workforce in general and what, what lessons we can take from COVID that we might like to change going forward. So the first is the safety evaluation study, which took place at Circuit Health in Altona North. Um, the, this, the general practice was existing there and they added on a drive-through testing clinic, which many will be familiar with. Respiratory clinics may be something new to people. These are um, newly, these were funded by the Federal Department of Health and were designed to provide funds to clinics to build or, or renovate an additional space separate from the normal patient base, such that you could limit uh, potential for cross-infection. And this was the first such clinic set up in Victoria and the third in the country. There's now over a hundred of them. Our job was to assess the risks um, of running these clinics and drive through and to jointly develop mitigation strategies. And it involved basically sort of a participant observer um, uh, approach with two weeks of on-site observations in April and May. And you'll recall from Catherine's slides that that was um, <clears throat> relatively fewer detections being, um, fewer infections being detected, and then July and August when we were in the thick of community transmission. There's me on the job on the right there. Um, here's a little schematic of uh, how things went, uh, the, the process of uh, working people through the drive-through clinic. This was one of the tents that was put up by the, uh, by the Commonwealth government. And you'll see at the top of that little flow chart here with a little bit of a briefing. And then at the end of the shift of debriefing, this was around the psychosocial risks and distress levels, any concerns, feedback from uh, the staff. It had people working remotely inside the clinic over the wire, um, doing scribe work. Um, we had people managing traffic from an offsite car park and then uh, distinguishing between patients who were going through the drive-through versus parking and walking into the clinic. Um, each patient was approached by a nurse and an assistant to take temperature and do um, oxygen, dose, oxygen saturation levels. And then this is the pathway where the clinicians were actually um, taking swabs. Here's a general practitioner taking a swab of, uh, of a person in, the, um, in their car. On what did we find? Uh, a range of risks were identified and multiple levels of mitigation strategies were put together um, back and forth between us, the experts and, and the clinic staff. Um, and this was in the context of obviously a changing pandemic, changing understanding of the, of the virus, of the pandemic, uh, you know, going in, 
going into community transmission, and of course, rapidly evolving policy um, at various levels. So there was lots on traffic management, um, surprisingly very basic <laughs> sort of health and safety, but um, quite important, um, pedestrian safety around the moving vehicles. Um, and the need for ongoing monitoring of mental health and well-being is uh, probably needs very little explanation. Big change in distress and concern levels among healthcare workers um, between April and then coming into August when we were in um, community transmission. We did pick up an overuse and over-reliance on gloves, particularly for non-clinical staff, such as security and others. Um, and that we would have people wearing gloves um, for hours at a time, which is obviously not a good idea. Um, far better to not use gloves and to hand sanitize regularly. Um, novel points of contact exposure were picked up by observation. Here's a, uh, a small example, but this was the level of detail we went to. You can see this, this is um, uh, a nurse taking oxygen saturation level on the fingertip and the lead is contacting a car, potential source of contamination, and these, these instruments were fully decontaminated after each patient encounter. Other things that were going on, the wind, this was a terrible, these plastic gowns were terrible in the wind and there was a lot of windy days. Um, these were quickly dispensed with. Um, the gowns would flap around, distracting the worker and also contacting the vehicle. We replaced them with cloth, uh, cloth gowns, for example. Um, right from the beginning, um, my colleague Ria, an infection uh, control specialist, um, talked about a buddy system for, system for doffing, that is when you take your used PPE off, PPE meaning personal protective equipment, um, not the language of spotters, which sounds a little bit more like a compliance check. Um, this is about um, co-workers looking after each other on the job. Very easy to make uh, mistakes while you're taking these things off and potentially contaminating. Um, but for all of the hypervigilance um, that um, is exercised in patient interactions, things can all fall down in the tea room. Um, this is a classic problem, uh, not new in this uh, situation, but one that we were on right away because um, you let your guard down in the tea room, there's hand to mouth contact, you may be closer to people than you should be. Um, obviously you're not gonna have a mask on while you're eating. So uh, lunchroom was a big focus. And then, of course, in the news in the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of discussion around changing policy uh, about PPE, in particular, mask use uh, versus, um, versus a, sur a surgical mask versus respiratory protection. So here's, um, here's an illustration of the difference here. This is a particulate filter mask, which will pull out some fine aerosols, um, whereas this is a surgical mask, which um, air can pass right around the outsides of these. They are useful, um, but in certain contexts, they may not be enough. And uh, the clinic, uh, with, with our support, uh, went with a precautionary approach. And in close patient contact, during uh, community transmission periods, this is what we we're talking about in certain contexts here with uh, the title. Um, we did um, go with using uh, face shields and full protection for um, up close patient work. Uh, the evidence for airborne transmission is still unclear, um, but, uh, and that is in the absence of aerosol generating procedures such as um, intubation. Um, but um, we we uh, are have gone with a um, with a precautionary approach and and are participating in the debate discussion and debate around this um, to try to assist work with the regulators and with uh, policymakers in this space. Um, here's an example, an illustration of how things changed between April and August. Um, this is a quote from uh, Mukesh, who is the director of, of the clinic where we worked. Um, with our respiratory disease clinic sitting on 63 positives since the 2nd of August, and known positives in their family coming to be tested and for clinical exams, I defy any of our colleagues from other states to sit here and consult with surgical masks. Um, that was over a three week period. Um, uh, and um, I think, uh, gives you a bit of a concrete illustration of the feeling there on the uh, right at the coal face. So what conclusions can we draw from this? Well, they're all provisional. <laughs> Everything is changing um, constantly. And uh, what it requires is, um, we, we would say, first of all, in, in a very broad sweeping way, that drive-through testing in respiratory clinics can be done safely with adequate resourcing. Um, but there's a need for a comprehensive approach and ongoing communication 
uh, between the various stakeholders, practitioners, experts, government, NGOs. Um, and we just have to be nimble and to be listening to each other carefully with open lines of communication. Um, we're, in a, we're in ongoing dialogue with the Federal Department of Health. We've commented on the policies and guidelines of the Royal Australian College of General Practice and others. So that's it for that little segment. And now for part two, we'll take a wider angle view, <clears throat> stepping back and looking across the entire workforce. What, what are we seeing uh, in terms of lessons that we might learn from going forward? Well, first, in the working population, uh, we do have to anticipate substantial health impacts from the disruption that's happening, economic disruption, through changes falling in job security, rising unemployment, and other effects. Um, job security is a powerful influence on mental and physical health, and we also have been able to demonstrate that even local unemployment levels affect job security that's perceived by someone who is still employed. You might understand that intuitively, um, but we've been able to demonstrate that empirically. It's quite a powerful, potent force and one that is uh, changing right now, as we've shown in the past um, in the GFC uh, global financial crisis in the mid-2000s. Um, next, I'm going to talk briefly about suicide. <clears throat> And the event that that raises any issues for anyone, I wanted to put up these uh, these lines for um, anyone who may be distressed by these uh, by this discussion to seek support there or other other examples. Um, we know quite a lot about economic shocks um, and the consequent unemployment and elevation and suicide risk. We did a 10-year study <clears throat> from 2001 to 2010, looking across the country. And during that period, on average, unemployment was associated with a four to eightfold increase in suicide risk among men and women. Um, during the global financial crisis, that is comparing 2006 before to 2007 to 9, we saw uh, a further increase in that unemployment risk of approximately 20% for men and women. And this was associated with a rise in unemployment from four to 6% during the global financial crisis. We traveled relatively well during that global crisis as a country compared to other countries. Um, and yet we still had um, uh, detectable impacts. Unemployment now in July was estimated at 7.5% nationally and is projected to rise into the low teens. So that is very concerning, obviously. Um, <clears throat> and the last line shows us that there was also an impact among the employed population, particularly in males. Men are more affected by um, job security than women. Interestingly, um, it's a social phenomenon. Uh, and uh, the important point of raising that, 7% doesn't sound like much. But of course, there's far more people who are employed than unemployed. Um, and in absolute numbers, there are greater numbers of suicides happening amongst unemployed employed people compared to those who are unemployed. So those two are quite important and may be mediated in part by job security as well as other impacts. What can we do about this? Um, there are lots of countermeasures uh, that can be put in place and I'm happy to say a lot of them are already happening at the labor market level. Um, national examples, job keeper, job seeker, uh, more could be done on job creation. Uh, the national and state health and social welfare levels. There's a range of things that can be done. We've already seen uh, a lot of additional resource put into mental health, um, telehealth, online supports, um, social welfare, and so on. At the employer and industry level, um, things can be done there and minimize job cuts um, and try to share the burden of um, the contraction that's coming on. Redundancy funds are available for workers in some sectors and stress prevention at the workplace level is quite important, as well as access to supports such as employee assistance programs. Uh, also, our NGOs, non-government organizations, our Beyond Blues, our Vic Health, they're very busy at work making important contribution. Also, workplace mental health, suicide and prevention um, programs, uh, other workplace stakeholders such as unions. There's a um, workplace suicide prevention program that we work with um, here from Deakin and with colleagues from the University of Melbourne called Mates in Construction. This sector um, will be particularly hard hit. Um, you may, listeners may be aware that there are approximately three suicide deaths for every female suicide death. Um, so 
larger problem among males, and this is a very, and uh, in particular among lower skilled males um, and blue collar males. And um, so this is a sector that is bracing for uh, potential uh, bad impacts here. Um, the good news is that um, this program is well entrenched um, across the country, as well as other efforts similar to it. And we've just received um, uh, funding from the Million Minds to uh, be part of a larger uh, partnership going forward with um, uh, a large project on preventing suicide in men and boys. So um, it's good that we'll be able to be there uh, assisting in that sector. Um, What's COVID teaching us about our, uh, our system of work in general? Um, casual employment is a common factor in many trouble spots. Um, uh, you can pick that up from the news, um, aged care, security, abattoirs. Um, this has come to uh, the attention largely around uh, the absence of sick, sick pay, which is a problem if you have to sacrifice pay in order to not go to work with symptoms or wait a couple of days for your results. That's a clash with public health needs. Everyone gets sick at some point in their life. This is an issue that is, goes beyond um, pandemic context, but has been brought into stark relief by the pandemic. The high occurrence of multiple job holding is a common phenomenon in casual employment, particularly, particularly for those um, uh, in, in uh, ages around 30 to 50. Um, and we've heard a lot about this and the need to quote unquote, um, to stop it. Um, but what's important to realize is, uh, and there hasn't been much discussion of this in the media yet, why are people doing this? They're doing it largely in most cases because they can't make ends meet. Uh, they can't get enough hours or enough pay. Um, so there's a system problem there underlying um, the pandemic problem. Other aspects of casual employment are important to uh, highlight as well in terms of equity. There's an overrepresentation of women, younger workers, migrant workers in these jobs, uh, several fold elevated risk of sexual harassment for young women, uh, particularly in the, um, in the service sector. Uh, this featured in the 2020 respected work report of the, um, um, the uh, uh, human, um, uh, the national report, sorry, I can't remember the exact title, um, but this is quite uh, an important thing. Low pay, low employer investment in OHS, and uh, and other training, poor regulatory oversight, and high job insecurity. Um, the positive uh, with respect to these workers is, you know, workers doing aged care uh, ha are newly appreciated as essential workers. Um, and the question is what we can do about casual work to eliminate or mitigate a lot of this constellation of negative factors of, uh, of casual work. So this is just one rather, um, uh, it's a large problem, but one that we should engage with going forward um, <clears throat> um, uh, and looking post COVID. Uh, to finish on looking beyond uh, COVID to, um, to a you know, COVID free world would be nice. Um, be, will be a while, but it's important to be looking ahead. Um, and Vic Health hosted uh, a series of talks about this, reimagining various aspects of life and health after COVID. And the first one was on work, um, where we talked, um, we had a wider ranging discussion around the need for work to be sustainable, the need to improve equity at work, um, and the need for work to be sustainable in a health and well being way, but also for that sustainable work to fit into a more sustainable society. And links to that will be provided with the, um, with the email following this session. Um, so I'll close there, um, hopefully on a, on a slightly upward note. Um, and I will remind listeners if this has raised any concerns for anyone, there are numbers available for support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. I think what you've just articulated is that once we've uh, beat the numbers, the COVID numbers, then the real work begins. Um, yeah, there's no quick fix to this. Our final speaker of this evening joins us from the UK in York. Dr. Glenn Laverack is a Deacon alumnus and an international leader in health promotion and empowerment with a distinguished career spanning 35 years as an academic and as an independent advisor with the UN government and development agencies in over 50 countries. Dr. Lavrak is a member of the Technical Advisory Group on Behavioral Insights and Sciences for Health, 
which was recently created by the World Health Organization to help fight the COVID-19 pandemic. He has published a number of books, no notably including the 2018 publication, Health Promotion and Disease Outbreaks and Health Emergencies. Glenn, thank you very much for, for joining us from, from the UK. Good to have you on board, over to you. Thank you very much, Rachel. So, uh, just as an alumni, I'd like to say that um, doing a PhD at Deakin was a pivotal point in my career, certainly because of some of the people I met there and it's led on to me having many, many more opportunities in public health. So I would certainly recommend doing a PhD at Deakin, I guess. Um, for the past 12 months, I've been living mostly in Spain. I got caught up with the lockdown there and I contracted COVID when I was there actually, and that delayed my coming back to the UK for a short period. Um, but I've mostly been working with, uh, at a national and at a regional level with public health colleagues in the Mediterranean and in Scandinavia. I mean, just to put that into context, into context the UK, as you know, has had over 41,000 deaths. Spain, around about 30,000 deaths. And Italy, over 35,000 deaths. Now, I'm not an epidemiologist. Just for the record, I'll state, state that I'm not an epidemiologist um, because I work very much with uh, national level and regional level and international agencies about how we can work better with communities in public health. But even I know that um, the way in which deaths are recorded, there's no standard definition for that at the moment. Nothing's being given out by WHO. So we have to look at these figures, you know, with a little bit of a pinch of, with a, with a pinch of salt. Um, I just want to give you six very brief statements and I've got a few notes that I want to refer to for each of these statements. This first statement might sound a little bit, might seem a little bit um, provocative, but it's not because as we know that uh, the lockdowns, the travel quarantines, for example, even social distancing has really impacted on people's lives, their livelihoods, their health and their well-being, and longer term, you know, on the economy. And most countries that have been seriously affected by COVID have enforced national level and localized um, lockdowns. I think there's only Sweden and South Korea, for example, maybe one or two other countries that haven't really used this technique. Um, the problem is this removes the ability of people to make choices in their lives and that means it disempowers people and as we know empowerment or power is directly related to people's health and well-being. Health is political. If anyone didn't believe that, they certainly know it now in the way in which this whole pandemic has become politicized. And some of the decisions that are being made have, seem to make sense and some of the decisions that are being made seem a little bit senseless. I think what's important, my point here is that what we need is a strong and effective and well-funded public health system in every country moving forward because these sorts of decisions have to be made with the best evidence that we have with the best public health guidance. Not least because the circumstances that have led, for example, to COVID and could also lead to MERS or Ebola, for example, still persist. And in many countries, there is an issue of capacity around surveillance and around prevention, public health prevention. And just one last general point, and that is that I find it difficult to compare countries, particularly around numbers of cases and deaths, for example, because to me, from my uh, social science background and working in 50 countries now that I've worked in, context, con the context matters, you know, whether that's a socio cultural context, economic, political, or historical context of a country has a direct impact on a public health response. And what might work in Australia might not work in New Zealand, or what might work in New Zealand might not work in the UK, in Spain, or in Sweden. What might work in Sweden might not work in Vietnam. So we have to look very much at you know, each country and look at its context, I think is very important. Uh, next slide, please, Sam. So I'm talking about living with COVID, you know, with or without vaccines uh, in the future, because at the moment, the best uh, scenario we've been given is from the Director General of WHO, right, who's saying that we're going to be living with COVID for at least another two years. And this very much living with COVID to me is, is the only way forward, really. And it means maintaining low community transmission. And as you know, this means 
everyone needs to comply with the preventive measures that are that are being advised at that time and that means masks and social distancing and hygiene and quarantines and self-isolation in the future probably vaccination i think there's only about 50 countries that have actually made using masks compulsory and in many countries um, in the uk for example in spain in the usa um, using these measures are mixed not everyone is complying with these measures we see it don't we every day when we go out onto the street we see this so in order to maintain a low community transmission, we need a real sense and actuality of social responsibility to protect ourselves and to protect others. And that means moving forward towards relatively normal lives, let's say in the next two years. Ne uh, next slide, please, Sam. Means that we need to focus on shielding and supporting the vulnerable the elderly, people with underlying health conditions, refugees, seasonal workers, people in low, you know, socioeconomic or overcrowded conditions. Certainly questions have been raised in many of the countries that I'm involved with about the public health response in regard to how we've shielded vulnerable people, for example, in care homes, in residences, or in quarantine hotels, you know, for travelers or for workers. I, in countries like Italy, for example, there was a discussion about mixed generational families, which is a, a social cultural aspect uh, in the north of Italy, which may have led to more rapid transmission of the disease. Um, in the UK, I saw a figure recently, a study recently that 40% of deaths attributed to COVID have been attributed to people in residences. And I think this is a similar context in other countries. So we need to uh, be able to shield and support the vulnerable. What's been, to me, been encouraging, looking at many, many case studies of what's happening in different countries around the world, is that they're encouraging examples of how individual families and communities have voluntarily, uh, or with very little assistance, shielded and supported other people. Whether that's in Italy, leaving a note on someone's apartment door, asking them if they need help, or delivering food, or in... Um, in Spain, organizing music and entertainment events on, on the balcony of apartment blocks to create a sense of community coherence, which I was involved with myself. Or, for example, in the UK, where people have been making masks um, you know, and then distributing them, cloth masks, and then distributing them within the community. We're really seeing, you know, how communities can, communities can, basically, and are an important aspect of living with COVID. Uh, with COVID. Uh, next slide, please, Sam. So how do we maintain social responsibility within this particular context? We're certainly not going to do this by trying to change behavior, individual behavior, person by person, because we just don't have the time, the resources, or even the capacity in many countries. What we need to do is enable people to have more control over their circumstances so they can protect themselves and they can protect other people. And this is what we would call empowerment. In public health, there are good examples of how both a political action, and that's policy and legislation, even fines, for example, enforcement alongside social action, social responsibility, that's where preventive measures for maintaining low community transmission have become normalized. Everybody is doing it within society has the, the political action, has, if you want to use this terminology, have nudged, has helped to nudge the social action, has led to positive health outcomes. Um, in this context, there are a number of examples, but in this context, I think passive smoking, for example, might be something that is worth looking at. We need to maintain trust. And one thing I've not seen in, in any of the countries that I've been talking to or working with is um, working closely with community-based organizations, with faith-based groups or charities, or um, with NGO sport groups, for example, because they have an established network of contacts and they often provide a bridge between state policy, for example, and, civil, and what's happening in civil society. They can help to develop trust quicker than it would be from government. And trust is one word that keeps coming up all the time. Of course, as has already been pointed out, we need 
trusted sources of information, ideally from the government, based on the evidence. But where this is not available or where people do not trust government, we're seeing how people turn to the media and this can lead to misinformation and can lead to rumors. Ideally, we need more than that. Ideally, we need a dialogue with people. And this is something else I've not seen used much in countries because people need to discuss these issues, their concerns, their fears around uh, COVID, for example, and how they prevent catching COVID. And just one way, the informatic approach is, is insufficient. So we need to think about things, how we can use health coaching or peer education, possibly in a safe way online. And ideally, we also need to help people to be more critically aware of their context. Why is it that they're more at risk? Is it because they're living in overcrowded conditions, for example, or they're living in dormitories, for example, because they're seasonal workers? And what is it they can do to um, amend that situation, if you like? I, I was involved in a poor community in a city in the north of Spain where we used photo voice, we used images, uh, standard technique for people to express their concerns and their fears and their needs around you know, the lockdown and the de-escalation in that country. And this helped people to identify potential solutions. Um, for example, one issue that came up with was the number of discarded masks that was lying around everywhere in the streets and everywhere people went. So, you know, there are participatory and simple ways that we can use uh, to help people to develop more trust and to develop more of a critical understanding of their context. Um, for me, what's important is governments need to recognize the value of this level of interaction, community-based organizations or community. And we need much stronger funding streams for, this, for these people to work, to help to work with communities in a whole range of activities that can help to maintain social responsibility. So next slide, please, Sam. In my experience of working in a number of disease outbreaks, Zika, SARS, COVID, and Ebola in particular, there will always be a minority of people um, who cannot because of their circumstances, maybe they're in overcrowded conditions or whatever, or will not maintain you know, a sense of social responsibility and low community transmission. With Ebola uh, in West Africa, when I was working uh, there, it was around secret societies who were not burying their dead in a safe way. And this was leading directly to more cases. With COVID, as we've seen recently, uh, it's groups of adolescents or youth that are having illegal raves, for example, in Spain and in, and in the UK parties uh, that is leading, uh, is felt leading to greater transmission. But also we've seen demonstrations from the anti-vax and from the anti-mask movements recently in Germany, for example, uh, in the USA. But there's also been many other demos, pro open protests with many thousands of people who are not using, many of them are not using you know, preventive measures in Kenya, in Belarus, in Spain, for example. So in order to reach these groups, we need to have, and it's already been mentioned, I think by Catherine, we need to have tailored interventions, interventions which are targeting groups or communities within society. And in order to do that better, we need to have a good understanding of the social cultural context of these groups in order that we can engage with them and work with them to identify what their needs are or what their fears are for better information or, they, or, or we can take even top-down actions to try and control these situations better. Uh, my final slide, Sam, or my penultimate slide anyway, is I guess I, what I'm suggesting is at this point in the COVID outbreak, particularly for those countries, you know, where this is really we're having a regrowth of the virus, if you like, um, coming through. We need to have a paradigm shift. It's okay. We need to look at the epidemiology, of course, and we need to look at the clinical challenges, but we also need to look much more at engaging with communities, with working with community through community-based organizations, through strong um, funding streams, and we need to be thinking about how we can give people, individuals, families, and communities more control in preventing the spread of this virus. That means we need to be thinking more about the social sciences, how we collect data, and how we translate that information into good programmatic recommendations, a weak point which I've seen in other disease outbreaks 
uh, where there's been a lot of qualitative information, but it's never been used because no one knew how to translate that into programmatic recommendations. And we need a workforce which is um, culturally competent. Again, a, weak, a very weak, big weak point in public health. We need workforces that are able to engage with and work with different groups within communities. Of course, you know, the overwhelming burden of disease moving forward is going to be with non-communicable diseases. But there are, going to con there are ongoing outbreaks and there are on on ongoing problems with infectious diseases such as TB and HIV, hepatitis B and polio. I've been very much with, involved with the polio eradication program. And there are many lessons we can learn even from these programs looking internationally at how we work with communities and how we work um, with community leaders, for example, um, in order to engage with people at that level, in order to get them on board with working with governments, both through political action and social action. My very last slide, Sam, is just a summary for those of you that are going to get the um, slides. Uh, it's just a summary of what I've already discussed. Thank you very much for your time. Glenn, thank you very much for those insightful comments. Um, it, it just draws home to me after speaking to a colleague in the UK last night, the importance of communications. Um, in the UK, there is a, a apparent lack of understanding about what the rules are, because there are so many mixed messages coming out. Um, and in order to actually have social responsibility, we need to have clear communications coming back to, to Catherine's point. I'd like to thank all three of our panel members tonight. That, that, that has been a fascinating insight to the work that you're doing. Um, it's generated a number of questions. So uh, I'm going to do my best to, to bat them to you. Feel free to bat them to one of your other panel members. But uh, I'm going to start with our, our, our very old dean of medicine, Gary Rogers, um, who's asked the question, could the panel please comment on how the lessons learned from Australia's very successful response to the HIV pandemic, such as regarding community engagement, stigma, structural risk factors, personal empowerment, have or haven't been drawn on this time round. And I might start with Glenn, since this is something that um, you've just recently just spoke about, Glenn. So if you can come back on screen, that would be terrific. Otherwise, I might, oh, no, there he is. Are you on mute, Glenn? Uh, sorry, sorry, I had a technical issue. Could you just repeat the question? Mm, sure. So this is about your previous comment. This is about um, how, how have we drawn on the lessons uh, learned from our very successful HIV pan, um, response to the HIV pandemic? Um, yeah. How have they been drawn upon to manage the COVID-19 pandemic? Or haven't they? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, not just HIV, but uh, you could argue with the Ebola outbreak, there's a lot of uh, publications following that. I mean, I know it's a different virus, but we're talking about a disease um, outbreak response, ongoing outbreaks, for example, with polio. Um, all, these in all these responses um, down the line, if you like, place an emphasis on working with communities. Anybody that knows anything about public health knows that it's about working with people, about working with individuals, working with families, working with communities. Uh, and this is what we discovered with Ebola, for example, um, and with polio, that unless you engage with communities, with families, with individuals, then you're not going to get very far with changing their behavior or encouraging them to, nudging them, if you like, I keep using that term, um, to you know, um, to change their behavior. Um, the, 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 to me, the problem is we don't seem to learn many lessons. You know, there seems to be no real institutional memory or carry forward because many of the things we learned from Ebola or that we've learned with HIV and that we've learned with um, not being used in COVID. I've not seen very much, as I said in my presentation, a recognition by either by international agencies who are working on this issue or by governments that we need to work with communities. We need to recognize the value of working with communities and we need to provide strong funding or support streams so that communities can start to help themselves and you know, to shield people and to help people protect themselves. So 
To me, it's not really about what we've learned because all the lessons are there, believe me. And the book that I wrote was in response to this lack of uh, using the lessons that we've learned. The book that I wrote on health promotion and disease outbreaks is very much about how we use a community engagement and a community empowerment approach in the disease outbreak. So I think uh, one of the people raised this question in the Q and A's is, um, why, if these lessons are there, why, this is, this is the real question, why are we not using these lessons in future ongoing or future outbreaks like mm -hmm. COVID? Why are we not doing that? That to me is the real question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Glenn. Um, Catherine, you had your hand up. Thank you. Um, look, I, I think the HIV story was a really interesting one. It was an unusual one. I know my uh, infectious disease physician colleagues from the Times talked about that being a situation where you went in to see a patient and they knew more than you did about all the research being done in the world. We had a very educated, very motivated and a very active group of patients who actually, part of the, the, the broader gay community, really turned things on its head. It was a change point really for the way we did public health. So the fact, as Glenn said, that we haven't taken this on board and we're not learning from it, particularly in these complex social um, issues around your actual intervention and your, your community transmission control is, is weird. And, you know, I, in my mind, I'm a very visual person, but I, I picture, you know, we've got everything in place, our lessons learned, we've got some really good structures, we've got some good capacity, the pandemic happens and you build this massive big tent over here somewhere and you try and pull things in in a panic when in fact, you know, you're, you're still going to have a much better response if you build on the capacity and understanding you have and work together. And I noticed another question about siloing of expertise. You know, again, that doesn't come together very effectively when you, you start to get into that, that sort of panic response and where you, you build some other response that doesn't actually articulate with with the sophisticated nuanced understanding we have of our own communities, let alone how we can respond to, to this new pathogen. So mm. I, I do think it's frustrating and we could do better. So Catherine, just coming back to one comment that you made in your talk, and that was the potential for a CDC. Uh, and, the, and I think that would be an excellent idea. In, you know, it would be a repository for all of the lessons learned. But when I look at the US, um, they don't seem to be listening to their CDC. Uh, six million infected individuals and going up. Do you have any yeah, thoughts I, I, or comments? I'm probably not thinking of the Centers for Disease Control model necessarily in America. I think that is a, a, a different setup again that's part military. It's, it's a very, you know, complicated system actually and the relationship with the politicians and where it sits in a pandemic response is really important. So you do have to have clear pathways of communication and of um, responsibility that are enacted in various stages of a, of a pandemic. We have all those systems in place. And even then there was still confusion sometimes about who was actually responsible at different points in time. So it has to be built into your pandemic planning. And that includes uh, the people who make the call on various aspects. And if you built expertise that could be marshaled nationally or taken to states if you had a particular you know, need like we've had in Victoria most recently, then it has to also be a clear part of your governance, of your um, um, the way it relates to our public health law and the way we can enact, you know, or engage, whether it's with the community, with government, or you know, with other agencies as needed. Mm, thanks, Catherine. Um, Zenon had a question. The COVID Safe app was encouraged by federal and state government to be installed on at least 40% of the population of smartphones in order for lockdown restrictions to be relaxed. Has the app been leveraged for contact tracing? Communications about the app appears to have stopped. Is this because it was found to be ineffective? Uh, does the panel feel that this is still a key tool in reducing community transmission? Uh, who wants to feel that one? Tony, Catherine, Catherine? I'll, I'll go first. Others might have comments. Um, and I've had people communicating with me about that from the public um, as well. It is frustrating because I think, you know, the, the idea of it is good. You know, it's a, it's a technical support. It allows you to identify casual people who might be within a close contact space, theoretically. But the system that was put in place in Australia um, on Apple smartphones went to sleep and you have to actually activate it every day before you go out. And as soon as you make it complicated and it's not just a matter of downloading, but you've got to think to turn it on every time you go out, it's not going to work. 
I'm not sure that we communicated very well either in terms of privacy and people, I don't think, ever fully understood quite how it might work. We've seen models overseas where it's worked a lot better. And so I do think there's, there's a lot to be done to actually get the right apps to have this acceptable to the community, people understanding it's secure, but also understanding the important role it plays and how it might prevent them from having to face lockdowns and other things if we could get it right. So getting the device or the app right, getting communication right, it, it could have been a big player, particularly in the second wave, but, um, but we missed that boat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I've got a question, a couple of questions for Tony um, from Polly. Which labour organisations were consulted during the testing of drive-through testing? And what do you think will be the impact of this period on migrant workers and international students who do not have access to any of the governmental schemes like Job Seeker or Job Keeper? Yeah, okay, um, thanks. So good, good questions. Now the, the, I'll take the second one first, which is, you know, what, what are the impacts on those particular groups of people? They would be terrible. Um, I know that in some instances, to Deacon's credit, Deacon did extend a hand of some support grants for international students who were stuck here, um, but they have been left out of the, um, of the federal response. States have um, made some efforts in this regard, but it's definitely a gap. And, you know, migrant, well, migrant workers classically are in um, uh, many in 3D jobs, dangerous, dirty, demeaning. Um, these are the jobs, these are your abattoir workers, for example. Um, many, many aged care workers um, would be disproportionately migrant. Um, and uh, it's that constellation of, of risk factors, low investment in training, low, low pay, all the things I relayed on that slide. This mm -hmm. is um, where we're speaking the same, the same language here without, you know, just naming other uh, groups that have been negatively affected. Um, uh, the first question was what labor organizations were involved in the evaluation of safety. There were no um, labor organizations involved in that project. That was a Melbourne Uni project uh, funded by the Commonwealth government. Um, and I was, I was sought as a collaborator and as a health and safety expert. Um, so sorry, there was no labor, uh, uh, there was no stakeholder. We were the, we were experts coming in working with the clinic staff um, and um, and, and all of the organizations working with that clinic, security, laundry, et cetera. Thanks, Tony. Um, moving to Glenn. Glenn, uh, where's my question gone? This is a question from Gerard. Um, how do you think social responsibility extends beyond national borders? And where does the UN fit in, in underscoring the risk? Uh, for example, countries such as the USA or Brazil follow public health policies which grow the reservoir of infection and allow people mm. to travel around the world, effectively transporting the risk to high risk groups in other countries. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Gerald. It's a good question. I was just looking at that actually. I mean, I, th I think the UN has a very important role to play here. You know, we're all, the capacity in many countries for public health responses is very high, for example, like in Australia. Uh, in some countries, it's very weak, the capacity, and therefore many countries around the world are looking for a central point for advice and guidance on this outbreak. And where is that going to come from? I guess it's going to come from the UN, right? Um, it may, if you're in South America, people may look more towards CDC, but I think internationally, they, they're going to be looking more, if they're not looking, um, if they don't have that capacity within their own country, they're going to be looking at the World Health Organization. So it's the, the UN has a very important role to play in promoting a sense of social responsibility and in promoting um, maintaining low community transmission. I, I've only seen this so far through WHO. I'm part of this, uh, this high level uh, tag on behavioral insights uh, and social sciences where we are discussing, you know, we're 20 people from very different backgrounds um, in the social sciences and where we're discussing, you know, these sorts of issues. But um, the presence that we get from WHO has been very much about, and this is what it does best, is looking at uh, the epidemiology. It would be good if we could see also have representation, for example, on the two weekly um, press briefs that it has somebody from representing this aspect of social science and communities. 
Um, because many governments I know from my own experience working at country level look to the WHO for advice and follow that advice. Um, so the UN plays a very important role, I think, in this, but it has to go beyond just communication. It has, communication, I'm not saying is not important, it's very important, particularly, as you said earlier, Rachel, about clarifying issues around the different stages within, uh, an, uh, within a lockdown or a de-escalation and the preventive advice that is being given out and how that needs to be changing all the time. But it has to go beyond communication. Communication is simply not enough. Uh, and in many countries, there is the capacity to engage with communities and to give advice um, about how governments can better work with communities uh, to provide a bridge between the advice that they're giving on preventing you know, the spread of COVID and what can be done at the community level. Mm, thank so you, I think man. the UN has a very important role in doing this. Well, let's hope they come up with something good. Um, Tony, I have a question for you from, from John. Um, at the Royal Children's Hospital, we've seen an increase in adolescents self-harming and attempting suicide. Do you fear for their future and what measures should we take to give them hope for the future? Oh, very important question. Um, I'm very sorry to hear that news. Um, I don't have a simple solution to that. Um, and of course, every case of self-harm has a variety of uh, uh, causes. Um, and so I, I, I can't give uh, a simple answer to that one. Um, the, you know, how do we give young people hope in general? Um, some of the, this is where the conversation in the, um, uh, in the issues paper on equity in the workplace uh, goes into some of this. Uh, young people are those who were most affected by unemployment before COVID hit and now there it's been compounded. So giving young people hope, um, job creation schemes explicitly for young people would be a way to give young people hope at a structural level that we can do as state governments, local, um, federal, um, and uh, tailoring additional support. I know the origins, um, the um, youth mental health centers have been very active, uh, perhaps, um, Perhaps insufficiently. Uh, perhaps they need even more of them now. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not active in that space. So uh, I'm sorry. I don't have a simple answer for that. But um, certainly, uh, greater greater job prospects post COVID would give uh, and and educational opportunities, training opportunities would give them some cause for hope. Those are things we do know that we can act on I systematically. Thanks, Tony. I, I suspect that universities also have a huge role to play in terms mm. of um, giving people hope and, and a, a brighter future. Yes. So you've, we've got one more question and I'm going to throw it to Catherine, since you did such a terrific job at spooking epidemiology. This question comes from Claire. Um, after her encouragement for people to become epidemiologists, what's involved in becoming an epidemiologist? Thank you. I, uh, I, I should point out that the picture you have up for questions, by the way, is not COVID safe. I just want to <laughs> point out that was filmed pre, pre pandemic. Um, good question. We, we've actually done a lot of work looking at people's career paths in epidemiology because training has only become formalised in recent years, um, in the last you know, 10, 20 years or so. Um, so it really depends on people's backgrounds. Often it's a postgraduate um, uh, specialization or you can now pick up some basic units at undergraduate level as well so it depends if you come from a clinical background where you might pick it up in postgrad and do specialization say through a master's of public health um, or you might go off and do a specialty training program like the field training in applied epidemiology if you come in with a bit more background training that's relevant and transfers across um, we're very conscious of it in Deakin. We have an advanced um, EPI stream within our NPH and we're going to be putting more and more infectious disease EPI in that as we go ahead because it really has revitalised that sense of um, a diminishing workforce with that particular expertise, particularly in the developed world where people stopped putting a lot of emphasis on it, thinking we had everything under control. So it probably is a postgrad pathway. Depends where you are, but it's really good to come and talk to an epidemiologist and they can, they can give you some advice.
Well, I know a, few, a couple of good epidemiologists right here. So thank you very much, Catherine. Um, look, at this time, I would probably, if we were in a, a non-socially distanced environment, I would present you each with a, a bottle of wine and a bunch of flowers. Uh, there's a mask in the post to you, which I've carefully crafted. Um, but uh, I would just like to thank you all for your time. And I'm just going to throw it back to Ian now for some closing remarks. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much, Rachel. And can I thank Tony, Catherine and Glenn for some quite extraordinary insights and really an incredibly refreshing look at both the challenges and opportunities to enhance the way we manage now and over the next couple of years. Um, whether it's epidemiological perspective, uh, sort of a public health clinical perspective or a population based public health perspective, we've seen both the opportunities and challenges. If you've been left with one message today, I think uh, Glenn summed it up, health is political. And all of our speakers reminded that the social constructs and contexts are everything in managing this pandemic and most infectious diseases that the world has seen over the last uh, millennia. We've also been reminded that health is not simply the absence of disease, it's actually looking at all of the factors that impinge on what makes life worth living. When the pandemic first started and we saw politicians standing up alongside uh, leading scientists and clinicians, I was incredibly heartened to start with. But as this has gone on, I've actually become a little concerned that what we've created in some way, and maybe this is just an Australian perspective, is scientists almost being perceived as the modern philosopher king. The response to a policy decision is we'll do what the science tells us. But I'm always drawn back to the philosophy underpinning this, and I'm particularly always drawn back to Karl Popper because he's hugely influential. And I've just got one quote to wrap up with from Karl Popper. Our aim as scientists is objective truth, more truth, more interesting truth, more intelligible truth. We cannot reasonably aim at certainty. Once we realize that human knowledge is fallible, we realize that we can never be completely certain that we've not made a mistake. And I think keep on coming back to that and bringing that back to a human perspective, a societal perspective, we will learn to manage our way through this and balance out all of those competing measures that make the decisions so difficult, so challenging, but just so absolutely important that we steer our way through. So once again, Glenn, Catherine, Tony, thank you so much. Stimulating, challenging, provoking. I just wish we could have more of this debate in the public arena so that people understand the nuances and complexities of the decisions that everybody is facing at the moment. Thank you. Thanks to the faculty for organizing this and thanks to our audience and have a great evening. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Ian, for those closing remarks. Um, through our research at Deakin, we have significant ambitions to make a positive and sustained difference to the future of communities, both locally and nationally. Uh, the slides that uh, Sam will show over the next two or three slides just illustrate some of the fabulous work that's happening at the university that's that almost has sprung up over the last three or four months and it, it spans not just the faculty of health but the other three faculties and research institutes it really has been a collective effort to address some of the most pressing urgent problems uh, that covid is is presenting if you'd be interested to join us on that journey, uh, this could be through talking to us about how your company could engage with Deacon's research or exploring how transformational philanthropy could scale the impact. We'd love to hear from you. So please do feel free to get in touch. Um, I would just like to finish there by thanking my colleagues in the advancement of Sam Johnson for putting together the, the, the event. It's been a terrific evening and I'm so glad you were able to join us. Thank you very much.